on the topic of judging, um, something interesting that I've been thinking about lately um, is how to, you know, how to get it right and like, you know, sort of trying to like thinking out of the box and, and actually even comparing how, how we're judged compared to um, other um, worlds, other bubbles, like, for instance, gymnastics, figure skating. Um, Olympic sports, because it's an Olympic year. I've been watching a lot more of that recently. Yep. And <clears throat> tell me what it's like, you know, from a staff perspective and, a, and actually even um, from the perspective of, of putting forth, um, you know, proposals for things like this. Um, to, me what, to me, what was always interesting is, do groups know what their max score could be? if they were going to do something perfect. So for example, a bunch of lines go into, cause I mean, you know, the top six drum lines, um, are being taught by people who've all won percussion before. Right. So you go into finals week and it's like, really, is that really? Is well, that I just, I didn't even realize like that. Colin, right you know, yeah. Like Colin, yeah. Angst, uh, Macintosh, you, Rennick, you know? Oh, wow. I mean, I, I didn't even realize that till yeah, today. So, yeah. but, but, the reality is not everybody has a chance. Like if, 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 you know, one group comes in and they play their book perfect, they're not necessarily going to get a perfect score, but that's never explicitly said, you know, whereas in other arenas, it is explicitly said, you know, where here's your max score possible. And it's based on what you're trying to do, you know? Um, would anything like that ever be viable in in terms of, because I Yeah, know, I know I know what you're getting at. Yeah. I don't I don't know. Um I know that they do that in WGI Color Guard. Interesting. Where if you're during if you're during these tricks, you can't score lower than this. So you're looking for compulsories. Yeah, exactly. That's that's kind of what that's what we call them, right? Because they they even tried talking about that in WGI percussion, you know, at the independent well at every level, I guess. And it was like, no, how, we, we can't decide on what's hard and what isn't hard. Right. You know, uh, we talked about that earlier, right? Is air more difficult than RAM? <laughs> you know, probably both are probably, probably pretty, pretty good. So how do you reward that? You know, so I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't know. I never thought about that, but it is interesting. It was just something that was on my mind because in the ramp up to the Olympics, and I think people are going to be paying more attention to that this year, all of a sudden you're going to see it. Um, and they've got, and all of those other arenas have gone through the same struggle where they redo their, they still are. Yeah. They redo their judging system and they yep. try different things. Um, let me ask you about something that I think you wrote on Twitter when you uh -oh. were judging. I don't know if you'll remember this tweet. It was about keeping your mouth shut. Yep. What precipitated that? And, uh, what was the tweet? <laughs> It was, it was, okay, WGI drummers, close your mouth and start thinking about playing your music cleaner, please. It has 189 likes as of today, 75 retweets. Um, what was going on? What was going What What precipitated First of all, I, I wasn't judging. Oh, okay. I was being a spectator. Oh, you were being a spectator. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I judged, obviously, but I wasn't judging that particular class, whatever it was. But I'm a fan. You know, I'm, I mean, I... I'm a fan. I, I'll go out in the lot just to watch people play and learn as much as I can, <laughs> you know? And, um, so I'll, I'll, when I get a chance, when I'm not judging or if I'm not doing booth time for a company or something, I'll, I'll go sit in the stands and watch. I, I still get a best seat. I'm a judge. I get to sit wherever I want in the front and watch these guys play. And I, I don't, and I couldn't tell you what class it was. I'm assuming with that comment, it had to be a class or what, whatever, but younger, younger players, but it was the whole, you know, and, and I called it, these kids are trying to get on the cover of the DVD, the, the surprise look, you know, for everything they play, you know, it, like, and I know visual guys tell them to do that because I've seen it, you know, because it's part of the performing and I'm, I, I hate it. <laughs> and there's so many, there was, there was this, I don't know, there was a string of four or five groups that came out and that's all it was. And they were. They didn't play clean at all. You could tell they weren't, they were thinking about their face more than they were thinking about their hands. And I had to say something. 
I was, I was, I was done. I'm going, to, are you kidding me? What are we doing to these kids? What are we? And I just went off. So I, I had to make that tweet. So for all the people, I, I do apologize for that, but not really. <laughs> well, so then let me ask you this because, um, your friend, Tommy, I go, yes. um, <laughs> oh, is it, this is good. This is going to be good. Let me get the popcorn. Um, well, but he's but it, his own man. <laughs> no, but no, but here's what, I, here's what I'm going to say. It's, it's in, even if the details and the specifics of it are different, it comes from, it comes from a similar place of like, what's important, what's foundational, what should we be doing? You know, what should these kids be doing? What's it about? Um, and everybody having their own opinion about that, you know, um, which I think, you know, you would probably say is a healthy thing because, you know, because everybody is very, is, you know, is expressing their, their extreme passion for this thing that they really care about, you know? Absolutely. Yes. But what's your take on, I mean, I mean, you just basically said what your take was on, on a little bit of that and what kids are being sort of taught at that level. But, um, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about facial expressions. You might be talking, I think you're talking about other things. Do I dare say poop squats? Is that what the, remember? Well, I mean, I, that, that's what Tommy calls them. Yeah. That's what, that's what Tommy called them. So, so what is your perspective on, on all of that stuff that basically, um, you know, indoor has really brought and, 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 um, has introduced to the, to the activity, you know, I guess in line with being able to do more stuff creatively, but then also increasing demand, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then having that, uh, make its way into drum corps, you know? Um, I know, I know you probably don't go to the extreme that Tommy does because, because you have kids that are, <laughs> that you, you, that you, um, you know, you have, you do, you give them things to perform that increase demand and like, you know, and get you to where you need to be as far as the overall thing. Um, do you, I don't know, like, what is your perspective on that? Well, first of all, Tommy's old school, right? He marched in, I think he aged out in 81 in the Bayonne Bridgman, which is even older school than all the other groups from 81, <laughs> you know, phenomenal drum line, great, whatever. Um, and so they just stood still and drum. That's what drum corps was back then. I get it. You know, that's, that's what, that's where, that's what he thinks, you know, that's what, that's where he was. Um, I think a lot of it's in jest that he talks about. Um, when I taught, when, when I saw him, he did a post about that and called him poop squats or whatever. I, uh, I reached out and I go, dude, and he's going, so man, the visual guys teach him that. And I go, no, that comes from the drummers. He goes, what? I go, yeah. The guys come in the line and I go, Hey guys, we got, what do you want to do here? <laughs> and the guys in the line come up with, these visual things that they do. And guess what? It's harder to do that instead of standing still while you're drumming. It's harder. You get more points. That's why it's turned into what it was. And I think I got to be honest. I think we were the first ones to do it in 03 when we had the snare line dance during the snare break. They did this little dance thing. Instead of just standing still playing, we actually did this movement thing that Micah Bruce came up with at the time. And I'm going, can you guys do that? And Casey Brohard can do it really well. And they ended up doing it. I'm going, I think we're going to put that in the show, you know, <laughs> and, and then that was like, okay, game on. And that was also right around the time where all the indoor lines were doing that stuff too, you know, and it was, and I know for a fact, it's harder to do that than standing still and drumming. It's harder. It's more difficult, you know, and how can you out difficult that other group? Well, you better sound good. That's still a priority. You got a great sound quality, but if you're doing other things while you're sounding that good, yeah, that's probably going to be more effective upstairs too. You know, more points everywhere. So now I'm, hey, the guys, whatever the guys want to do. Every year, and George, I don't, I don't know if I did it in 94, 95, but um, every year I'll sit down with the drum line and say, okay, you're sitting down in front of the best drum line in the world. What are they doing? Are they ramming notes? Are they modulating? Are they dancing? Are they skipping? Are they playing snares, tenors, and bass drums? Are they, I mean, what are they doing? What do you guys vision the best drum in the world today is doing? And their answers are pretty good, you know, and that's where we get a lot of the ideas that we actually put in the show, you know, where they come up with the stuff, you know, the, the whole moonwalk thing we did a couple of years ago. I was just going to ask, 27, the moonwalk in 2018, yeah. That was brought to me by Brandon Olander. I told the snare line, I go, so the snare break, it's a very difficult snare break, I go, but we got we to raise it up a notch. We can't just stand still and play it, you know, so come up with something you guys want to do. 
And I kept thinking, and we can't do the same body work we did last year. You know, I mean, you can only do so many things from the waist down. There's not a lot of options, you know, because, you know, some of our visual guys, oh, yeah, then we can do this and this. Like, no, we're drumming. You got to keep your arms here. <laughs> you know? So, oh, yeah, that's right. So it's, there's not a lot of options. And they came to me and Brandon Olander comes up and he goes, so we want to do the moonwalk. And I went, what? Michael Jackson moonwalk? They go, yeah. And I go, can you? <laughs> they go, well, he could do it really well. <laughs> One of the snares can do it really well. And I was like, well, let's give it a shot and see what happens, you know? And I know people have been, I saw a couple of posts recently. So people are bagging on that. I'm going, really? I mean, <laughs> why would you even, I mean, it's, it's, something, it's something new. It's something different. It's something that we don't do very often, whatever. But I'm, yeah, whatever the guys want to do, man, I'm all for it. Yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, back in, we're talking about going back in our area, the, the whole sticks in, feet together and all that. Now everybody's all relaxed and stuff. It's like, man, I wish I was marching nowadays. It looks, yeah, stands in the well, lot. Even, yeah. I remember back in the day when I marched, and even after I marched, we spent so much time on how to mark time correctly. Just marking time, you know? No, take your feet. Your feet's got to come off an inch off the ground, you know, the flat foot. It was like a big thing. But things have changed. You don't, you never mark time in the show anymore. You never mark time in the show anymore. <laughs> you're moving. You're either going left or right or forward or back, or you're standing still with your feet apart. <laughs> so why, why do we even practice marking time anymore? You know, they're just for working on temple control and you're going to be moving anyway. So that's why we track it up nowadays instead of mark time. But yeah, just those things, the, the evolution of the activity, right? Yeah. Hey, let me ask you something about the turn of the century. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but uh, I guess finals night in 2000, the, the bass drummer incident, oh, we don't have to name names or anything, but can you give us your take on that? Because you know, it's something, stuff you read on online, and I just want to, I don't know, to hear your... Set, set the record straight. Yes, there please. we go. Yes. <laughs> what do you, what do you guys know? What do you think happened? Honestly, I I missed that era because of the job that I was doing, and you know, so. But then reading stuff about, you know, there were the bass drummer who they were missing just ran onto the field and they put the drum somewhere. And I, I mean, I don't know. I I'm curious. I, what about you, George? Have you heard anything about that? I've only heard you bringing it up. The urban legend, yeah. The urban legend, sort of. The urban legend, yeah. Um, yeah, I can tell you what kind of happened. Um, after semifinals, we were in Maryland that year, I think it was in Maryland, DCI. Yeah, it was definitely Maryland. Um, after semifinals, uh, one of our bass drummers, along with some other people from other drum corps, decided to go off into campus before they got on the bus and do something they shouldn't do. And campus police caught them, took, took them to jail. <laughs> oh, wow. So that was the Friday night uh, back in the day where all the instructors got together. It was a big party, right? Because the, the night before the last day of the activity, they always had a big bash with all the instructors. It was, the DCI ran it, and it was at the headquarters ballroom or whatever. And it was just a big party. So all the instructors are there, and all the judges who have already judged are there. The guy judging Saturday night couldn't go, but everyone else was there. And so I'm at, we're at this party, and this is, um, I think I had a cell phone then. I think there was the flip phones back in those days. And I remember someone came up to me and said, hey, man, is your phone working? You know, and I go, yeah, why? Because our director is trying to get a hold of me. And um, I end up going, oh, and I pick up the phone and walk outside where I can hear him. And I'm going, what? What, what do you mean? And sure enough, we had a drummer who wasn't with the core <laughs> that night <laughs> after semifinals and wasn't going to be with the core. So... Um, Basically, what happened is I had a meeting with Dave first thing in the morning. Uh, they got him out. Um, he was with, he was on the same campus as the drum corps. Let's put it that way. They put him in his own special room and kicked him out of the corps. You're done. You know, this is, these are the bylaws. You, you broke it big time. You're, you're out. Um, the other drum corps that also had their members caught, they sent their members home on the bus that morning. Pack your stuff. You're out of here. And so they left from what I heard. Um, we decided since he had a ride to get home from another drum corps after finals, that was his only way to get back home. You know, we didn't want to spend money on a flight, whatever. Okay, well, let's just keep him away from the drum corps. And then after finals tonight, he can go off, you know, and go back to his place. And it was one of the worst days I had in the activity. I got to be honest. We're here rehearsing for finals with... 
open. You know, so, okay, can you cover that spot? You cover this spot. Okay, you, you play those notes, you play these notes. And we are scrambling to try to just get the moments that we needed to be very clear, very clear, and everything else just, just good luck, guys. <laughs> you know, we have, you know, and finals day, the Blue Devil, we rehearsed one block. You know, it's like a three-hour block, if that. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> you know, so there wasn't a lot of time to redo the base book. So um, the story goes, uh, we get to the warm-ups for DCI finals. We couldn't even warm up with the drum line, which, as people know, we've done every year as a full ensemble. We couldn't do that because we couldn't play the exercises because we're missing a bass drummer. And we didn't have time to relearn the exercises for the bass line. So we warmed up in sections for finals. And then we got together and played to the music once, and then we walked to the field. I remember walking to the field. We get to the field. Um, I see the kid who got to the parking lot as we were warming up. And he came up to me, and that's the first time I've seen him since the incident. And he's, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, you know, and I'm hugging him. And I go, dude, I go, I think everything happens for a reason. I don't know what this is. And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, he, and he was bawling, right? And he walks away. And I figure, okay, that's the last time I'm gonna see him. And it was very sad, obviously. So we were at, we walk into the show. Um, I remember I get into the stands. I'm sitting in like the second row where they have like a staff seating. Vic Firth and Ralph Hardiman are sitting in front of me. And I'm sitting, and Rick Odello is there. And he's sitting next to me. So here we are getting ready for finals. And then all of a sudden, Rick leans over and he goes, did I just see a bass drummer run on the field? And I went, what? What are you talking about? He goes, I think I saw a bass drummer. He goes, oh, whatever. You know, and you know, I mean, every finals goes by fast. It's a blur, right? Things are happening and they got cameras on it. It's just a whole different experience than every other show. So a lot of stuff's happening, a lot of people everywhere. And I didn't see anything. But then I see the drum line started in the back of the field, like by the 50, they're on the back sideline. And I see a bunch of plumes popping up. And I'm going, God, the drum line's pumped up, man. They're all hyped up. This is awesome. You know, I think they're just getting ready for the show. So the show starts, and about halfway through the opener or whatever, a quarter way through the opener, the drum line, you finally see the drum line and the bass line kind of like open up so you can see the bass line. And I, they opened up this form, and I went, there's five guys. There's five guys out there. My first thought was, well, our director decided, let's let them do finals. That was my first thought. I go, I can't believe we're letting this kid we just kicked out of the core come back and do this last show. Show goes on, show's over. <laughs> we finish. I, I don't know if we were on last that night, but I remember we were getting all of our stuff ready at the front of the field, and the director walks up to me, and I, I grab him. I go, you let him march? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, he marched. He goes, what do you mean he marched? I go, we have five bass drummers on the field the whole show. And he goes, what? And he freaked out. He didn't know. And I'm going, you don't know? I didn't know. And... I found out, I mean, <laughs> the director <laughs> said to the base tech, get him and get him out of here. And literally, as they were like kind of trooping the stands back then, if you want to call it trooping the stands, the base tech literally ran, grabbed him, and they took off a the different direction and went back to the truck, got to put his stuff away, and that was it. And it wasn't until later, like, I don't know, months, could have been a year later or something, when I saw him again. <laughs> and... Uh, he came up to me and he goes, I just did what you said to do. And I go, excuse me? And my whole motto is never let your brother down, right? Never let your brother or your sister down. You know, that's what we, you know, the person standing next to you, man, you're, you're doing this for them, not just for you. You're doing it for that person around you. And he goes, I couldn't let, I couldn't let my brothers down. And that was his reasoning. And he planned this whole thing. So the rumor has it by himself that he hit his uniform, got it off the truck while we were warming up, grabbed his drum, hit it. And when we walked to the field, he literally had this place where he was, I don't know, behind a bush or someone else's truck or wherever, but he got on his uniform, put his drum on, and right after we finished the minute warm-up, that's when we started the minute warm-up back then, I think, but he ran on the field at the very last minute, and I didn't see him run on the field until they opened it up, but um, yeah, he um, shouldn't have marched, <laughs> basically, but he didn't want to let his brothers down, so he ran on the field, and people, people thought, oh, they're all applauding, apparently, because they thought, oh, they just had a head change. The guy just broke his head and they just got it done in time for him to make the show. That's what everybody was talking about. And I'm going, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think, yeah, well, I've always been curious because I read about it and it's like, okay, well, let's, like you said, set the record straight on it. Yeah. Was, uh, I mean, was there any talk after that by from the director? Like, 
I don't know, like upset. Oh, extremely. <laughs> as as was I. <laughs> you know, as was I. I was like, wait a minute, you know. And here's the topper. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you. I, I don't know if I, I'll tell you. The this. statue. The statue limitations is up. It's it's, it's okay, you know. <laughs> this same performer, right, came out to me years later. Um, and I mean two or three, four years later. And he goes, hey, man, he goes, um, I want a job teaching the baseline. <laughs> oh, wow. And I went, excuse me? And he goes, well, I was found not guilty. Yeah, I had to go back, and I was found not guilty, so I, it's all good. I'm going, we kicked you out of the core. <laughs> you rebelled. I go, no, I'm not hiring. I can't hire you. What do you think? It was like, oh, my God. Just the, the, that thought process I thought was very difficult. Now, I, I, I want to say, too, you know, in the early 2000s, I kind of remember a time, I, I want to say it was here in Southern California, that uh, a law enforcement officer walked up to you in the parking lot <laughs> and uh, <laughs> kind of startled you a little bit. Do you remember that at all? <laughs> Absolutely, I remember that. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, the, the urban legend on this one goes that, uh, you know, he walks up to you and, you know, asks you your name, and that he <laughs> asks, you know... That he that tells you that he's there to to arrest you, and that you have like some startled look on your face, and you're all why, and that he tells you for playing dirty beats. <laughs> I should I should have won an Oscar for that performance. <laughs> we were at a, a get together before the show at Gary Juarez's house, who was our base tech at the time, and uh, his buddy I can't remember his name. Who was that? Do you know who it was? I, I can't remember. I I don't know. Yeah. He was a CHP. He was a, he was a police officer. Yeah. Oh, we don't need to name the department. We don't need the name to the department. Luckily, it was before YouTube, so. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, uh, well, yeah. But, um, <laughs> so anyways, he's a big fan. You know, he's a drummer. He played in, I think it was BK or somebody. I don't remember where he played, but he was a drummer. And knew Gary really well. And he goes, yeah, well, actually, I'm on duty tonight, so I won't make the show. He goes, but I am patrolling that area. I go, oh, dude, we got to do something. He goes, what do you want to do? And I go, you need to come to our lot and arrest me. And we just started brainstorming this idea just to freak out the drum line a little bit. And all I remember is Ivan Pacheco was in the snare line that year. And he's looking like going, no, no. And what happened was he come, he pulls in with his lights on, right, <laughs> on his car. Gets out of the car and he walks up and he goes, um, excuse me, are, are you Scott Johnson? And I go, no, no, I'm Sean Vega. I go, that's Scott over there. <laughs> and I point to Sean. <laughs> and then he starts walking. I go, no, man, no, I'm Scott. What's up? And he goes, yeah, um, and he goes, I'm sorry, we're going to have to come with me. And I go, what? And he goes, sir, you're, you're being arrested. I think you know what for. You know, and it was one of those things. And I'm going, what are you, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You know, and I'm, I should have won an Oscar. I think I was that good. <laughs> and the line's freaking out right now. You know, I've been starting to cry. And he's literally got my hands behind my back. I go, wait, what is this for? What, what, what is going on? <laughs> and he goes, I'm arresting you. And, he, and I go, for what? And he goes, for dirty beats. And we both just start laughing at the drum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That was a, I forgot about that. That was, that was the, a good the, the part of the urban legend I, I, I forgot about was the part that you were actually in on it. I forgot about that. Oh, you know, I, I set it up. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that Gary, uh, he's, he's, he's a good dude. He's a, he is a good dude. He's always a good guy. Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, you, you mentioned Brand, Brandon Oleander earlier and there's a, I forget the year it was uh, the famous video of him. Uh, how old was he in that video? 12. 12. Playing the Diddy, you know? Yep. He was, play, he was playing the Ditto 8. It wasn't the actual Diddy. It was a new one that I did called the Ditto 8 at the time, but yeah. What was it like seeing his progression from then all the way <laughs> through his age out? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, so and, and, and how did that, did he just walk up and say, hey, uh, can I drum with you? Or No, what, um, we were doing assistant blue camps back then. Oh, okay. And he was one of the, we call them the campers, right? <laughs> Where the kids come and they hang out the little for the weekend, they get to drum with the drum line a little bit, play exercises, and they got clinics going on the whole day where we're rehearsing. Some with me, some with some of our staff, some with local talent, whatever. And it was a you know we've been doing it for years, and it's just a, a good thing for the kids to they, be a blue double for a day. You know they get to come hang out, they get to eat lunch and dinner with them, hang out with the drum line, and then we always the last thing we do is we do this little thing where the, we call I call them campers. They all sit in front of the drum line and we, we play through our music and play through the book and do question and answers and see if some guys want to come up and play some of the exercises with them or something. And um, we're playing Ditto 8 at that time. And um, I'm looking at this little, probably the smallest kid there, you know, and he's got this hair out to here, but, you know, back then. And he's, he's got his arms up like this. 
And I'm looking, and Gary Wars was on the base tech that year. And Gary's looking at me, and he's looking at the kid, and Gary's going, he's playing the snare part. I go, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? And so we finished. Um, I think that was Roberto Paz, I think, was section leader that year. And um, I looked at this kid, and I kind of nudged him, and I go, hey, you got this? He goes, yeah. I go, you're in. I go, Ro I go, Robert, you're cut. Roberto, you're cut. Dro drop your drum as low as it goes. So he puts it, we're on stand, right? So he puts the drum down as low as it goes. Brandon stands in the middle, and I go, kick it off. And I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no clue. We were just having a good time, right? We were having fun with the campers. And the rest of the guys in line are looking, going, what is, what's happening here? What are you doing, you know? Here's this kid that's half their height, you know, literally 12 years old, playing with these 21-year-olds. And he kicks it off and plays the ditto eight. The impressive part that some people, I've said this on a few interviews, but the impressive part to me was there's a split flam part in there that I wrote. He knew where he was in the line to play the correct split flam part. That's when I went, okay, this is a different level. <laughs> and then what people don't worry, because it isn't on the film, I don't think, but after we did that, I go, you got the opener? He goes, yeah. I go, kick it off. And I was totally just seeing what would happen, right? And one of the guys in the snare line leans over and goes, hey, man, we made a change last night. And Brandon goes, yeah, I got it. <laughs> I'm going, what? And sure enough, we played through the opener with him. <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. I, I, you know, I met his dad. Obviously, his dad was there. I go, so what is up with your kid? <laughs> and he goes, he lives on YouTube. He lives on YouTube. He loves you guys. He transcribes everything and then plays it and learns. I go, he transcribes it. Wow, that's crazy. I go, does he write it like freehand, like a 12-year-old? Does he write out the words dot, 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 dot? I mean, well, how does he do this? He goes, oh, no, he's a Sibelius. And I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> this is a different level. Now, in, until he made that line, did, did he keep in touch with you, like, throughout the years? Oh, he auditioned every year. He auditioned every year when he was 12 years old, 13 years old, 14, 15. And his hands were literally good enough when he was, you know, 13, 14. But I wasn't going to put him in the line with a bunch of 21-year-olds. You know, the maturity level as anybody who did the blue doubles, you know, can tell you that last week, it gets intense. You know, I mean, it's, you're going for a world championship. You're going to try to be the best in the world. The whole mental approach of being that consistent, it's, it's, it's a grind. It's a, the last couple of weeks are, it's a grind. And I kept thinking he wasn't mature enough for that, you know? So we waited till he was 16 and then he shows up and he also, he was pretty weak, you know, um, just a weak kid. And he knew visually he had to get better to the point that his dad hired a personal trainer. He lived in Arizona. And so this personal trainer worked with him all the time to build up his muscles and to get him ready for this. And he showed up uh, when he was 16 years old and auditions. And I knew he, he could always oh, drunk. That wasn't the issue. It's like, you're going to get through the visual audition. He did really well and smoking on everything else. And I remember sitting down with his dad. I'm going, I go, if you're okay with this, I think we're, I think he's ready. You know? And so we, yeah, it was. And so we took him in. I remember, um, I forget exactly what year it was, but um, I had a conversation, I ran into him, because Pete and I taught a system blue camp once, and Brandon was there, so we had met there. And then at the Mount Sac Drum Corps show in Southern California, we ran into each other in the lot. And I basically had the conversation with him and his dad, and it was, he was, you know, his dad was asking me, do you think Brandon could handle this, you know? And... I, and I had the same reaction, like physically, it would probably be difficult. Like he probably needed some steps before that. Um, I said, but what I told him was, I said, when he's ready and he's able to do it, they're going to take care of him. And I was really confident, you know, like, I, I don't want you to worry about your son, you know, being, you know, this young teenager going on the road and doing this thing with these guys. So he went and he marched academy and that was like a good you know, like sort of, uh, precursor, you know, getting him used to it. It was local to him, you know, um, and the rest is history, you know? Well, and I remember sitting down with his dad and Brandon and Pete Emmons, who was the core manager at the time that we're taking the 16 year old kid into the drum line, you know, and I remember sitting down going, okay, I go, I, I think, I go, I, I think Brandon's ready. Are you sure you guys are okay with this? And I'm talking to Pete and Brandon's dad, because Brandon was definitely okay with it. <laughs> he was okay with it when he was 12. He wanted to do it. And um, his dad said something I'll never forget. He basically said, he goes, um, he goes, I don't trust him with anybody else. 
this, I know this is going to be the best thing for him, the best place for him. You know, that meant a lot. I mean, that meant a lot to what we've done in the past and what we're still doing now. So that was, that was huge. And even to the point where this was the first time. And I remember when we used to block up and walk places with the drum line, right? going to a warm up zone, going to the show, whatever. And the snares would get in the nine spot, right? Three, 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 and just get nice and tight. And I remember telling them, Brandon goes in the middle. You know, even though that wasn't his spot in the line, but whenever we walk somewhere, we put Brandon in the middle of all these big guys around him to protect him because I had no idea what people were going to do. Here's a kid who already had a million hits on YouTube at the time, you know, was this phenom that everyone's talking about. And at the warm ups, everybody's there to see Brandon. And it was like to the point where, and he's, he's a pretty shy kid. I don't know if you had a chance to, you know, he's, he's pretty introvert and better now, but back then it was like, and I go, yeah, I go, you, you got, you know, eight big brothers that are going to be with you the whole time and don't hesitate. And they, and they all look at me and they go, we got this. Don't worry. And I go, nice. That's cool. Hopefully in the future, maybe we can have them on the podcast. I think sure. that would be cool. Uh, I think this is a good time to maybe wrap it up for the night. Sure. While I know we still have a lot to talk about, we are going to wrap this up for tonight. And, uh, what decade are we in? Where are we at? Are we in the 2000s yet? We're, we're <laughs> just into the 2000s with some segues, but... Uh, All right, 20 more years. Scott has been... Yeah, Scott has, <laughs> Scott has been nice enough to say that he'll come back and do another episode, and, you know, we can marathon through the, these last 20 years. <laughs> but we don't want to shortchange anybody, because I know there's going to be uh, listeners from the modern era, even though I guess we call it the modern era, that, you know, want to hear about the contemporary blue devils and and we'll get there, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, Scott, obviously I got a lot out of this personally, um, you know, having been taught, taught by you. Um, but like I always say, you know, we like to interview people that are, you know, icons of this activity. But the point of this is, is really to have these great conversations about, you know, stuff beyond that and stuff, you know, getting to know you as people, you know, uh, because you are, you know, trying to trying to do this thing um, that we all love, um, and we appreciate you being open and uh, with all the great stories and stuff like that. Yes, yes, so, definitely. Thanks for taking the time. It's good, good, good trip down memory lane. It's fun. And with that, I will, uh, you know, good night, Scott, and, and uh, thank you for being here. And we hope to see everybody soon. Again, here on the Drum Corps Coffee Shop Podcast. If you can, leave some comments. We always like the comments to, to see what you guys have to say about our podcast and uh, give us a review. And with that, anything else, George? Nope, that's it. All right, everybody. Until next time. Until next time. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>